Hello, welcome to Chapter 3 Podcast, the show for readers of science fiction, fantasy, and romance. This is Season 1, Episode 24. Today's episode is continuing on in a series about where to start in reading with different genres. For this episode, joining me to talk about where to begin in reading fantasy, I have Liana from Liana's Library, who I'm sure you all know and love because she's been on many episodes with me, and a new guest, Jashana from Jashana C, who also has a YouTube channel, and I will have them linked in the show notes. For those of you on the YouTube channel, you might notice things are a little bit different. We are testing out a platform with video, so something new. If you want to check out the YouTube channel and see our faces, we're going to see how this goes. If you enjoyed the podcast, I would really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review us so we can continue to reach more listeners. And if you're interested in getting early access to episodes as well as exclusive bonus content with all of our guests, consider supporting us on Patreon. Huge thanks to all of our supporting patrons and especially our world-expanding patron, Trina. You all make this possible. Thank you guys for joining me tonight. We're going to talk about fantasy. I think this will be fun. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, Jashana, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Only Jashana. I mean, <laughs> Liana, you are also welcome to introduce yourself to any new listener. And it's the debut of my face on this podcast. I think that's a momentous occasion. Fair point. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, as Bethany said, my channel is just my name. And I talk largely about fantasy. I think. I'm at about 80% of the books I read are fantasy and about 75% now are adult, which is different from previous years. Yeah, mostly read fantasy, various subgenres within fantasy. I love it. And Leanna. <laughs> well, y'all should know who I am. You just didn't know necessarily what I looked like. So now you have the whole picture. Um, <laughs> I do primarily read fantasy as well, primarily adult fantasy which has been the case for some time. Important, I think, to know is that me and Shoshana never agree on anything. So this is true. you'll get Rarely. Okay, we a agree. variety of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought might actually be a good idea for an episode like this, where we're talking about where to start with fantasy. So people with different Whatever advice Shoshana gives, I will disagree with and vice versa. <laughs> We'll, we'll be able to reach people with a wide array of, of, of preferences. So here's where I want to start with this. What was the series or series that got you into reading fantasy? And when did that happen? Mine is hilarious. because so I is re- mine. <laughs> I reread this series a year ago and made two videos totaling in an hour's worth of footage of me ranting about this main character. Um, but it is the series that got me reading fantasy like heavily, uh, and that is the Sookie Stackhouse series, okay. which is paranormal urban fantasy romance. It's the series that the show True Blood is based off of, and I much prefer the show, even though it is also ridiculous. But yeah, that's kind of what got me going. I started reading a lot of, at the time, like paranormal fantasy romance with vampires and smut and whatnot and then I just slowly started reading more and more just general fantasy and other subgenres and here we are. Awesome. Yeah. Is, that, is that, that the cat? <laughs> I tried locking her in my bedroom and she was having she was so upset about it, just nonstop meowing. And I was like, okay, I'll let you out. <laughs> so she's letting me know how deeply, deeply upset she was about that for any period of time. <laughs> Ended. personally offended uh-huh. yeah so my uh, intro to adult fantasy um was the terry good kind sort of truth books which are uh infamous in the adult <laughs> fantasy community for being like the worst of all fantasy series is the the sort of accepted opinion and any opinion other than that is the wrong one um so i hold the wrong opinion i enjoyed Likewise. them and i continue to enjoy them <laughs> Look, we, for anyone who is interested leanna and i have an entire episode on the podcast dedicated to defending the sort of truth series by terry <laughs> we Goodman. outed ourselves <laughs> sort of we did i mean they're fun yeah yeah i've never read those they're like they get a bad rap i think because the author was an interesting person who thought he was writing political philosophy and not fantasy 
<laughs> Sorry yeah. for any any technical difficulties if I sound differently. We're still kind of working out the kinks here. Yeah, but I mean, Terry Goodkind was an interesting person who thought he was writing political philosophy and not fantasy. But if you just kind of ignore that, the books are fun. <laughs> <laughs> like we liken them to Marvel movies where they're like yes. over the top, mm-hmm. but like you get into it and you get invested in the characters. The characters are great. Like he writes actually pretty great characters. <laughs> but they're nothing groundbreaking, but they're good kind of fun. I mean, it's like learning that like Joss Whedon thought that his movies should have won Best Picture because this was actually a deep work of philosophy. <laughs> kind of what it's like reading sort of truth books when you hear that Terry Goodkind has that to say about them. You're like that's not what I got out of Thor, but <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good, uh, that's, that's a good comparison. So in terms of where I got into fantasy, I actually think probably the sort of truth series might've been my, one of my first introductions to adult fantasy as well. The series that got me into fantasy when I was a kid was the Chronicles of Narnia, I got those as a gift from my parents for my seventh birthday and read and reread them many, many times and (laughs) read a lot of fantasy for children. I guess some adult stuff. I started reading like Robin McKinley that had been put in the children's section, although I don't think all of it was intended for children (laughs) in, (laughs) in my library growing up. So I've been a fan of fantasy since I was pretty young. Yeah, I feel like I... Like when I was younger, I'm sure I read some little chapter books that were technically fantasy, but I just, there were no like series like that, like Chronicles of Narnia. I didn't even read Harry Potter when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Like none of, none of that. So like there wasn't like a series mm-hmm. or any one particular book that I'm like, yeah, I remember that. So yeah. I mean, my mom read Harry Potter to me and my brother when we were little, like, not, by the time the last one was coming out, she was not reading books to us, but like the first two or three for sure. And I mean, I read books. I mean, I read the Red Wall books. I think that would, I mean, Talking Animals, that's, that's not a big fan, <laughs> right? Like series weren't that big. I feel like there were some series. Like there was obviously Harry mm. Potter, Narnia, Red Wall is a series. But I feel like in the Scholastic Book Fair, <laughs> there were like, I read Ella Enchanted. I, I read that like oh, 10 yeah. billion times. And mm-hmm. a bunch of other Gail Carson Levine books as well. She had a lot of like, fairy tale adjacent type yeah. material for that age range. Who wrote The Princess Diaries? Meg Cabot. Meg Cabot. I think she wrote some paranormal things. I never yeah. read The Princess Diaries, but I think I remember reading something with like a ghost in it or something. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't read those. I read The Princess Diaries, <laughs> but I know she did. She did also publish some paranormal stuff. That's interesting. interesting. It's interesting to me sometimes like at what point in people's lives they get into fantasy, what draws them in. Like I said, Chronicles of Narnia was a big one for me. Another one growing up and I think still holds up pretty well to this day is The Song of the Lioness Quartet by Tamora Pierce, which I picked up when I was like 11 or 12 and have reread many times over the years. So I do think there can be these great series for children that can get you into fantasy, but... Obviously, like Jashan is showing us, there can be other pathways into. So I just think it's interesting. Okay, so a couple things I want to do with this episode. I want to talk about different subgenres of fantasy and maybe give some recommendations for places to start in those different subgenres. And then also, what are some good places to start for different kinds of readers and readers coming from maybe different genre backgrounds that want to try fantasy in general. And, you know, I know for me, this tends to depend on the person, but is there a go-to recommendation that you have for people who are like, hey, I want to try reading a fantasy book? I think for me, if someone wants to get right into adult fantasy, I haven't read a fair amount of the like really popular adult fantasy like the staples in adult fantasy Mm -hmm. a fair amount of them just don't appeal to me I don't I don't I don't wanna but if someone wants to get right into adult fantasy the the more traditional fantasy swords and elves and stuff Mm -hmm. I think Legends of the First Empire by Michael J. Sullivan is a good one because his writing style is not super overly descriptive he's pretty straight to the point with like descriptions of things. He's more focused on the characters and getting to know the characters better. 
there's a fair amount of characters, but it's not difficult to keep track of them or whatever. Like you get to know each of them pretty well, but it has that like epic scope and, you know, moments that hit you right in the heart and everything. I don't know. I just feel like it would be a good segue for someone getting more into it. Like if someone wants to eventually read like a Song of Ice and Fire or Tolkien or whatever else, Mm -hmm. that's a good stepping stone into it. Okay. I mean, I do still recommend Terry Goodkind books as a starting place because I think it was a good place for me to start because his writing style, similarly to Michael J. Sullivan, is very straightforward. It is not, I mean, one of the complaints from diehard fans of fantasy is how tropey, cliche, and low effort the world building is, but that also makes it extremely accessible (laughs) for people who aren't super comfortable or uh, accustomed to learning a whole new world, learning a whole new lexicon, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that his names for things are like, basically a description of it <laughs> rather than a name <laughs> for it. Uh, yeah. It makes it very easy to like try out fantasy. I also just generally recommend if you've watched a show that is based on a book, then read the book it's based on. Because then like, again, with things like fantasy, a lot of that barrier is like, it's on you to imagine a whole other world, other species, other un- like non-existent animals, non-existent flora and fauna, seeing all this kind of magic that like you have to imagine it. So if you've seen a TV show, I mean, I wouldn't, once you've become a a reader, I wouldn't say, oh, always watch the show first and only then read the book. But like, if you've become comfortable and you kind of know this world and you kind of know these characters and you like it, well then read the book of it and then see how you do with that. And then maybe from there, then you have the courage to like pick up a book that you haven't seen the show for, have no reference point for, and like start from scratch. Yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. And I think there's a lot of great fantasy shows out right now. Uh, You have The Witcher. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of books behind that. I know it's known from a lot of people more for the video games, but there's a book series behind it. We're about to get uh, Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. Although (laughs) I will say, like, I don't know that that's necessarily the best place to start for newbies to the genre, unless, unless you are... Like, I would say if you're a big historical fiction reader and you write, like reading kind of dense, very descriptive historical fiction books, then Wheel of Time might be for you. Yeah. <laughs> but I think for people who are used to more fast-paced books, that is not a direction I would recommend <laughs> you go to begin your journey into the yeah. genre. One that I always think of, too, I guess I would say for anyone who wants to get into, like, kind of the more, like, traditional fantasy again, with like swords and magic and maybe doesn't want to go right into adult or maybe someone who reads a fair amount of young adult books already and wants to get into like adult fantasy. I think the Sen Realms series by Cindy Williams Chima, it's like the more expansive world and like you're following a cast of characters, but it's like pretty low on the magic but, and the magic isn't real complex. It's like wizards doing stuff with their hands and like, yeah. It's it's pretty like low fantasy, I would say, for for all of those elements. So I, again, I think that's like a good segue into that. That's cool, Leanna. I think you froze, but it looked like you had fallen asleep. Yeah. <laughs> you were just. Dry. I thought you guys had frozen, then I realized it was both of you, so it had to be my internet connection. So <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I have a hard time having specific recommendations to give to people who just generally are like, hey, recommend to me a fantasy book. And I'm like, uh, uh, (laughs) like, what do you like? What's your reading When it's like a specific book that like just recently someone said, a friend of mine read Six of Crows and they really liked it. Can you recommend them something that's the same? And I was like, well, what did they like about Six of Crows? Like, is it that they liked the heist? Is it that they liked found family? Is it that they liked elemental magic? Is it that they liked some like morally gray broken characters i mean the answer i got was they liked all of those things (laughs) okay just reread six of crows then (laughs) it all depends on like what you're into yeah definitely so we've touched on this a little bit in terms of talking about subgenres the thing with with fantasy is there really are so many different subgenres you can tap into and people are into very different things. I guess one place we can start is what, kind of just on what you're talking about is you do have your classic kind of high fantasy, which is there are arguments about what 
the <laughs> correct definition for high fantasy is. One of the main accepted definitions for high fantasy is it's in another world, not our own, and there are other beings like elves, mm-hmm. yeah. ogres, whatever the case may be, um, and with magic. And so that I think is what a lot of people think of when they think of fantasy. Your Lord of the Rings, your Wheel of Time series, and you know, we could give other other recommendations. I actually do have some recommendations for people who want to try getting into high fantasy but aren't super comfortable with it. So maybe that could be a place. But I just want to say that if that's all you think fantasy is, you are in for a treat because there is a lot more to it <laughs> yeah. than just well, there's that. Also, I feel like there's a, a misconception that is definitely well-earned, but a misconception nonetheless that all fantasy is just like white men with swords. And like mm-hmm. that that was the, the case for quite some time. And that it, there certainly is a lot of that still, but that's not it. Like, isn't only that. So if, uh, if you're interested in or you're looking for more diverse settings and if you want something more Arabian or more Asian inspired or African inspired fantasy can do that. Definitely. For people wanting to get into epic fantasy, if you find it intimidating, if you find Tolkien intimidating, one place that I do recommend some people start, and this again is not, I already know Leanna's not going to agree with me, but it's fine. Um, One place that, that I recommend people perhaps start is there's a YA fantasy series that I really love, the Witchlands series by Susan Denner. The first book is Truth Witch, and they are high fantasy, but I feel like they're a little bit, a little bit more accessible than some adult things. And I feel like especially for people who maybe have been used to reading YA fantasy and are wanting to bridge into adult fantasy, I do think it's a good bridge series, especially because as the series progresses, it reads more and more mature. I think the first book reads a little bit more YA, but like as things go on, the characters read more mature. I mean, it's basically like less explicit than adult fantasy would be, but it it has a lot of similarities. I think that can be a good place to start. I only read the first two in that series and I always meant to continue and I just never have, (laughs) but I haven't like DNF the series. It's one Mm -hmm. that I'm always like, Oh yeah, someday. Well, the last book is coming out next year. How many are there? Total. Um, So there's uh, five, which is including the novella. Um, Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so four main books plus a novella, and then the fifth book, fifth primary book, is yeah. coming out in 2022. Yeah, at least the first two, I concur. I mentioned earlier the Song of Ice and Fire as being something that you'd work your way up towards, but honestly, like if we're, it depends on. I mean, if we're talking about like a 14 year old who's looking to maybe try fantasy, I don't know that I'd recommend it to a young, you know. But like if it's somebody who just hasn't ever read fantasy before, but they're an adult, um, George R. R. Martin's writing style is very like. It's very straightforward. It's not like super flowery or hard to get into. And because it is a really low magic world, and there's a TV show, so you could always go with my original recommendation of read something you've seen the show for. But if you've never seen the show, it's a low magic world that it reads more like historical fiction than fantasy. So again, a big barrier for fantasy entry is like c- grappling with this whole alien landscape and magic and weird creatures and whatever. And The Song of Ice and Fire is yeah. it really does it like i mean you know there's like a running joke about like people thinking that like they've learned medieval history from a song of ice and fire but like <laughs> it's it kind of reads like that so it is more like politics and battles and armies and it's not like a weird magic thing that is a made-up word for it that you're like what is that <laughs> i've just heard people come, which i that was kind of my thing i set down the third books i was also listening to them on audio which for me personally listening to fantasy on audio for the first time is not the best choice for me because I get very distracted. I'm like, wait, what is happening? <laughs> um, but where it wasn't that his writing was like flowery or anything. I was just like, do this is going on too long. Like just a description of a situation where I'm like, okay, I understand. Can we leave this chapter already? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like for me, I would be hesitant to tell someone like, yeah, start with this. Cause I feel like, Maybe they'd be bored if they're not used to that. Theory. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it depends I feel like on what historical you fiction like. is just as guilty of that. So like, yeah, I mean, it's that's true. That's I mean, true. That's true. So you, yeah, 
this is the thing is I think high fantasy is a good place to start if you're into things like historical fiction because then you're used to it and it's that's true yeah but there are other types of fantasy I know we had talked a little bit about urban fantasy or paranormal romance which can be a good place to start especially if you're a romance reader wanting to get into fantasy that's one place you could go Urban fantasy is typically going to be something set in our real world, except with magic frequently in or around cities, depending it, the paranormal. It kind I feel like these genres kind of blur into each other a lot. Like I think oh, technically sort of fiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like urban fantasy technically is with like cities. This is urban, but it bleeds into paranormal where you get vampires and werewolves and shifters and mm. all of that sort of thing. But I do think there's some great series. Do you have go-to recommendations for people wanting to try that area of fantasy? The Parasol Protectorate by Gail Carriger, Soulless, etc. I've read them a couple times now and yeah, it's romance, paranormal, but it's it yeah, it's like a conglomerate of different paranormal, historical, steampunk, mystery. Steampunk. Yeah, <laughs> mystery. Yeah. And it just all the thing and like romance. There's mm-hmm. romance and there's a little bit of sexy times happening mm-hmm. here and there. It's not real heavy on that, but like it's there. Yeah. But the romance is like the driving force in the story. And yeah, I just think it's so much fun. Those are really fun. I think especially if you get on with Gail Carriger's sense of humor, it's very like British tongue in cheek. I I think they're witty. Great. Yeah. Witty little clumps and things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love mm-hmm. it. That's a good, that's a good one. Liana, do you have anything in that? I know this, this is less no your, gaming. less your subgenre. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Go. Which is what I always laugh Proceed. when I say, I don't like urban fantasy, unless we want to say that Neil Gaiman is urban fantasy, in which case he's my favorite author. <laughs> <laughs> Magical realism or urban fantasy, but things like that, where it's like mainly the real world, either present day or, or historical time period where there's something kind of magic-y going on a bit. So, like, I think of, like, the Night Circus or the Starless Sea, anything by Neil Gaiman. Those are the main ones that I've thought of. Um, or Jonathan yeah. Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is reads like historical fiction. But what if there was magic during the Napoleonic era? So, again, it's more of a you have a firmer foothold um, because it's not an entirely new world to you. There's just a new added element of magic. Yeah, um, I think magical realism is an interesting subgenre specifically because I think it feels the most realistic in some ways except with a hint of the paranormal. I I feel like a lot of the magical realism I like is in YA series. So the the Raven Boys and that whole series by Maggie Stevewater I think is great and I would definitely call that magical realism. It's so unique. It's set in like a small town in the American South and there's like hints of magic. It's very character driven. I love it. It's great. Also, Anna Marie McLemore writes a lot of magical realism YA books that will make you cry and have lots of queer characters. That's another direction to go for that. And then with kind of the urban fantasy paranormal, I think the two places I'll recommend are like the Kate Daniels series by Alona Andrews. I haven't read super far into it yet, but what I have read is good. So I think for those I would recommend for people feel like a gritty detective mystery type thing and you want to try that in a fantasy world you might try the Kate Daniel series because that's kind of what it is it's set in Atlanta where there's magic and technology and it's kind of like a gritty murder mystery but with magic so I haven't read them but I think the sort of masculine answer to that sec- uh, recommendation would be the uh, Dresden Files Dresden. Yeah. yeah that's what I was going to say too I haven't read it either but I just, I just read the first book for a secret vlog I'm doing from the oh, Dresden secret Files. Out. <laughs> secret out. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. It'll probably be up by the time this video goes up. It's fine. Yeah. And then the other one that I like to recommend that is kind of in this category is the Psy Changeling series by Nalini Singh. I just read the first one. <laughs> ah, yay. Really like it. It's so good. And again, this yeah. is like a bridge because it's a romance it's heavy on the romance. So this is like a good place for romance readers wanting to dip their toes into like urban fantasy paranormal. I talked about it in the last episode, so I won't go into too much detail here, but I 
I'm a huge fan of the series. It's great. I had that actually for my little notes. I had written that down too. Cause yeah, cause it, it has pretty, like, I really enjoyed the fantasy elements of it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like sci It's like sci fantasy, which yeah. I want to talk about too. Like I love genre blends like that, where there's like yeah. some yeah. magic and some science stuff. mixed together. It's fun. Yeah. But yeah, I thought that was like really, really cool. And I did enjoy the romance aspect as well, but like, I got like the world was really interesting. It's like, yeah. yeah, this is neat. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I know in the the last episode that was kind of an intro to romance, we had a section at the end talking about getting into romance for fantasy readers. And I think likewise, some of those books also really apply to getting into fantasy for romance readers. Liana, one of your all time favorites. <laughs> I'm going to let you talk about it, <laughs> is in this category. Radiance. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Shoshana is also a fan. Yes, I mean, as I am I, that. but I'm because really you... Because it's an objectively it. amazing book. You can't... If you read that and you hate it, I just... I will go full Alan on you. Um, <laughs> do you even read books? <laughs> but I mean, in general, I mean, I also just think Grace Draven is like... Yeah. I mean, Radiance is obviously my favorite, but I think in general, she does a pretty good job of like fleshing out enough of fantasy world to tell the story that she's telling i feel like oftentimes when you guys make me read romances that have fantasy elements and i complain about the fantasy elements you guys will be like well that's not what they're there to write they're there to write the romance so just ignore the cardboard cutouts around them and i feel like (laughs) grace draven does a good job of like doing enough world building where it is absolutely sufficient like it's not going to be super complex because then you would have to go in depth explaining it she's built a fairly simple world and explained it adequately so it doesn't feel like hollow or nonsensical it feels like you know a solid in a fantasy world for the story to take place in so I never have an issue with her world building yeah no that's that's a really good one in particular and then I also really really love uh Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri it's so good (laughs) I read uh, the new one yeah that one's really good too that one is not as much a like it has a romantic subplot yeah and I love it. I love the Jasmine Throne. But um, Empire of Sand is a slow burn romance with a forced arranged marriage that's friends to lovers. And like, oh my goodness, it's so good. But also the world building and the magic and everything is great. So. I'm surprised you're not bringing up Rain and Ruin. I, yeah, which I talk about all the time. <laughs> Me and Jashana <laughs> also like. Yes. This is why we're friends, Jashana. <laughs> <laughs> rain and, and Rain and Ruin. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but I, I feel like everybody likes those books. I don't know that I've seen anybody dislike either of those books. They're pretty solid. They're per- they're really good. They're just solidly good. Yeah. yeah. And Rain and Ruin is great because it's like half fantasy, half romance. Yeah. So it, it's and really it's Middle Eastern inspired, which is refreshing. Yes. Okay. So the next subgenre I want to talk about, uh, Liana, this is going to be your wheelhouse. <laughs> So let's uh, explain to the people what is grimdark fantasy and if they want to try it, where should they start? Well, grimdark <laughs> fantasy is for masochists. Um, <laughs> I mean, I kid, but I don't kid. I mean, it's basically if you want to read something like where horrifying things are happening and bad people are doing the things and bad things happen to the bad people and <laughs> just like lots of blood, lots of violence, lots of morally gray characters. So I feel like the same people that are into watching like mobster movies, like that's who Grimdark is for. Yeah, like there's not an epic hero's journey in Grimdark fantasy typically. Or if there is, it's like a really dark one (laughs) where either the hero is a horrible person who is nevertheless going on an epic journey or they started out naive and were quickly disabused of any heroic notions (laughs) during said epic (laughs) quest. (laughs) It's the genre for the cynic. Uh, it is. <laughs> it's nihilism, cynicism, and violence all wrapped up in a neat bloody bow. <laughs> okay. I mean, it can, there can be some great storytelling, some great characters, some interesting subversion of things. Game of Thrones is grimdark. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Okay. So recommendations. Where should people start? Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a shocked face yeah. <laughs> for anybody <laughs> listening. I mean, his uh, Twitter handle is Lord Grimdark. So what else do you need to know? I mean, he is, he's not the first person to ever write Grimdark, but he is kind of 
kind of the king of grimdark. One of the first people to kind of really pioneer the genre, although he was largely inspired by the likes of George R.R. Martin, who first showed up and were like, hey, you don't have to make fantasy nice. <laughs> and Joe Abercrombie was like, oh, good, great, okay. So Joe Abercrombie's a good place to start, but he's also, a lot of grimdark can be really dark and it can be really like i mean i don't find it too terribly depressing i like reading grimdark a lot but like some of it it can be a bit of a downer and joe abercrombie includes enough kind of gallows humor it's a lot of sarcasm and a lot of kind of throwing your hands up and being like well of course things went badly because things have always go badly so <laughs> it's, it's not like the kind of torture porn that you get in in some things where they just like love to just tell you all about the blood and how dark and awful this is. Joe Abercrombie will tell you something bloody and awful happened, but it'll be in this kind of like, why are we laughing? That was horrible, but I am laughing. <laughs> so that kind of keeps it from ever being too dark, if that makes sense. So what is a good book for people to start with if they want to try Joe Abercrombie? The Blade itself, because you should read Joe Abercrombie books in publication order. So yeah. get on it, Jashana, so we can be friends. You're staring at me. <laughs> All three of them. I bought the box since. I read the first trilogy, and now I have to keep going. I mean, I, I want to keep going, but also I have to keep going. Because <laughs> I own, like, three more of the books, so. Yeah, I don't think I've read too much, like, Grim Dark, I guess. I mean, I read the first two Song of Ice and Fire books, and I'm going to continue with that eventually. Mm -hmm. Not in a rush, since George R. R. Martin is not in a rush. No, My other favorite know. series to recommend, um, which is a lot, I would say darker, just because it has more like dark beasties and creepier magic. Like the Joe Abercrombie books are very low magic. There's very almost no magic. So it's just more like the horrors of war and the horrors of that kind of thing. Uh, and of bad people doing bad things. But the Raven's Mark trilogy by Ed McDonald, which I made Bethany read <laughs> Blackwing, that's the first book. It is a very sort of, industrial post-apocalyptic kind of post-nuclear fallout vibe because there's this very toxic magic that is like seeping into the land and the air there are like deformed creatures and there are like it's a lot more just like gross <laughs> monstrous <laughs> things around yeah. so i mean i do really think that that series is excellent and it has an interesting sort of political conspiracy plot to it it's some good characters but it is more i would say horrifying than what Joe Abercrombie writes. Yeah. I feel like we also have to talk about the Poppy War trilogy by R.F. Kuang, which is definitely grimdark military fantasy inspired by Chinese history. And it's, I mean, it's excellently written, in my opinion, but it's a lot. It's, I mean, she deals with genocide and war crimes. So, yeah. It's I didn't continue it's past the first book. Simply because there were plot and character development stuff that I just, I, I didn't dislike it, but I didn't mm -hmm. love it. And I have a pretty like strong stomach or like whatever when I'm reading. It takes a lot for me to be like, oh my God, like what? And yeah, there was a portion of that book where I was mm -hmm. like, can I read this? Oh my God, I'm getting like, my stomach is upset. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the Poppy, I only read the Poppy War, not because I don't plan to continue with the series, just because time. Uh, <laughs> I do plan to read the rest of the books. But um, it's unlike Joe Abercrombie. This is not like there are dark things happening. There's nothing to lighten the mood. Yeah. There is not like any kind of gallows humor to like kind of make you go, oh, isn't that awful? Though, well, yeah, it really is. No, yeah. no, it just is straight up awful. And then you yeah. learn it's inspired by real events, which is even more horrifying. Yeah. There's yeah. no upside. There's no silver lining. There's no light at the end of that tunnel. It is, it's dark. Yeah. Yeah. You're but like fully in it. <laughs> 100%. I mean, I do think it is very, very effective in terms of exploring the horror of war and mm -hmm. the effects of war on individuals, uh, like dealing with things like addiction and PTSD as a result of trauma. Like, I mean, it's very effective at what it does, but it is, it's dark. I've read the whole trilogy. And they're, they're very good, but I don't, it's I don't know. Not for faint of heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not something I feel like I could easily reread. <laughs> I'll put yeah. it that way. And not something that I would casually recommend. Yeah. I would be like, I would want to know a lot about this person, their tolerance, their taste before I would go <laughs> ahead and recommend The Poppy War. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I do think that for people who are interested in those issues more generally, interested in military fantasy and want, you know, don't mind seeing the darker side of humanity, mm-hmm. it's it's a good series for sure. But then sort of adjacent, I mean, we've talked about things inspired by history and inspired by, you know, having a lot of war and about things that are like urban fantasy or historical fantasy that take place in the real world. But we haven't talked about flintlock fantasy. Take it away, Liana. <laughs> well, flintlock fantasy, because like so far, like the even though so the Song of Ice and Fire is like very heavily inspired by real European history, but it's a specific, specific era of European history, which is very swords and shields. Um, there is flintlock fantasy, which is similar in nature, where it is a fantasy world with fantasy places and fantasy characters. Uh, and there's magic, but instead of taking place in an era that is reminiscent of medieval or Renaissance Europe, it is, we've moved up <laughs> to having guns. <laughs> so guns and magic is basically flintlock fantasy. Yeah. So recommendation for somebody who wants to try it out. Guns of the Dawn by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which I recently read. And it is... It's, I mean, it's an excellent book, but it is also an excellent example of flintlock fantasy. Not a strong romantic element, but it's got the trappings of like a Regency romance in terms of just opening with like a family that has a lot of sisters and like them being concerned about how we appear in society. But there's war. And because there's war, then that is bad for the home economy and for everyone's economy. And there's moments that are reminiscent to me of like in Pride and Prejudice when Lydia and Kitty are so excited because like the soldiers are back and that means there's dudes around. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But like the majority of the book does take place like on the battlefront. And there are like warlocks involved that like work for the king. So they're part of the war effort. But I mean, the majority of the action is guns but in a fantasy place like this is a fantasy conflict between fantasy nations that don't exist but it feels very much like england and france are at war and there's a swamp with guns and warlocks <laughs> yeah there's a series that i really love that's i feel like not quite that but adjacent to it uh it's i feel like slightly more modern than flintlock fantasy is it's like post industrial revolution but pre-modern if that makes any sense Mm -hmm. and also if you're looking for more diversity in your fantasy this is a good series the first book is a song of blood and stone by l penelope so they're kind of fantasy romance hybrids each book follows a different couple but there's a lot of politics and other world building things going into it as well and it's like a blend of magic and technology that i think is pretty interesting while also dealing with like racial issues and like there's a lot happening in them I think it's interesting one thing I will say is if you want to give it a chance at least get through book two because I've seen some people just read the first book in the series and say yeah this was okay and then not continue but I feel like the series really hits its stride with book two and gets much better the first book was her debut but the the series is great and actually later today um i'm gonna tell you that the fourth and final book in the series is about to come out so you're gonna tell us that but you're not telling us that now (laughs) no later in the on my radar (laughs) section i i will tell you so i look forward to learning this information (laughs) (laughs) if you want to hear the title stay tuned (laughs) for that part i haven't Um, read it but i think you've read it bethany isn't the second era of mistborn flintlock fantasy Oh yeah, oh, it yeah kinda, it it's like a like a Western flintlock fantasy. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's that's and I I read the first book in that and really enjoyed it. And it's kind of like almost like a Western buddy cop type thing is what it feels like, mm-hmm. but with magic, which is fun. Actually, too, with the there's there's been kind of a resurgence recently of this Western fantasy vibe, and I've really been enjoying that. One example, well, Joe Abercrombie did write a hey. <laughs> So I feel like there's kind of a resurgence of that, which I'm enjoying. Uh, There's a YA kind of queer Western girl gang fantasy, um, The Good Luck Girls by Charlotte Nicole Davis that I really enjoyed. It's very fast paced and action packed. So if you like something that's going to be like move at a pretty good clip, that is a pretty good one to check out. Sarah Gailey wrote a novella that's also like a dystopian fantasy western about librarians on horseback i can't like oh. the title you know what i'm talking about the the title is not coming to me and it was it was fun i can see the cover in my head <laughs> charlene harris who wrote the sookie books wrote 
recently or is in the middle of a series that's like western kind of dystopian mm-hmm. fantasy stuff oh fun i read the first book i was like it is a better book. it is upright women wanted see nice <laughs> yeah, i think that's like a fun kind of micro trend what's the Sookie Stackhouse author Charlene Harris and now I can't remember the name of the first book I can't remember the name of the book now Midnight Crossroad like this at the Midnight yeah, Texas that book two that's book one hmm. well this is Wyang and it's not uh, it's not a western but I lump it together because it's America Dread Nation duology which is about oh, yeah. Civil War zombies <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there is that which is also extremely excellent and I highly recommend <laughs> yeah I know Ray Carson wrote a Gold Rush trilogy. Oh, Gold yeah. Rush yeah. Walk the Earth a Stranger. Yeah, I yeah. haven't read them either, but I've heard I've heard they're good. Okay, so other subgenres, because we're going <laughs> to run out of time. You've covered but... Neil Gaiman into Abercrombie. I got nothing left to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you sure, though? Because we have not talked about sci fantasy. One of our mutual favorite authors writes a good not, bit of sci-fi. Fantasy. Not Jashana. <laughs> hey, I did that's another one I didn't hate the first book. I like <laughs> So we're talking about NK Jemison. Oh. I was talking I was about gonna say yes you hated it, Jashana told why. <laughs> yeah, that one I did hate. I thought we were talking about something else. Okay. But yeah, well, that one I didn't I didn't like very much. But I do want to reread it. I want to try it again. Okay. I mean, she's only like the most brilliant sci-fi fantasy author writing right now. <laughs> you are objectively wrong, Jashana. It's okay. We feel it's sad okay. for you. It's okay though. <laughs> Sorry. Honestly, she's an author that I'm like, am I smart enough for her? I'm not sure that I am. <laughs> Cause I've read uh, the book one of the dream blood duology and I was kind of like, I mean, I didn't hate it, but also what's going on. <laughs> But yeah, I, I would still recommend her to people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I really, really love N.K. Jemison. I think for people who, like, who would you, re- uh, Liana, who would you recommend N.K. Jemison to? Like, people who don't <laughs> mind the idea of being confused, like being a feature and not a bug. Yeah. Like, subject yourself to bewilderment on purpose. Yeah, on purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I think that if you have, like, that kind of caveat, going in like I think if I would have had that caveat going into the fifth season I may have Mm -hmm. been less like what in the heck am I reading right now because I just I spent so much energy trying to figure out and be in like sort everything out in my head and I needed to just go with it honestly monstrous (laughs) taught me how to do that though so that's kind of why I want to try the fifth season again because with monstrous I was like I'm just I'm confused. And it's fine. I'm just gonna keep reading because I really am enjoying these characters and this world. Monstrous is. You're right. It is similar. It's Monstrous is a great graphic novel series with really interesting world building. But yeah, similarly, you have to just kind of go with it and you'll learn as you go. And I feel like the fifth season. That's good. Good advice. I love them a lot. I do think. I guess I would say maybe for people who like to read literary fiction or like kind of mm-hmm. popular family drama like things or family dramas and things with like a lot of complex family dynamics mixed with societal commentary and things you really have to unpack you know like I feel like if you like that you will definitely like N.K. Jemisin I I, I feel like a good example like if you like a Quake Amezi you'll probably like N.K. Jemisin yeah stuff that's like a little more heady and like Mm -hmm. introspective and Mm -hmm. Not maybe not as like action packed and like woohoo fantasy right. stuff is happening. <laughs> a little yeah. bit more like sit with it and think about it. And I mean, I, I keep it. saying that I want to see the fifth season adapted, and I also keep saying that I want it to be HBO. But the reason is because like it, if anything, reminds me of a lot of the kind of like mini series that you see on HBO that are kind of slow. Occasionally, are like I don't know what that episode was about. Hopefully, the next episode will clear that up for me. Um, they like they they'll take a lot of risks, and it'll be kind of slow, and it'll be kind of introspective and philosophical, and they'll take risks with doing something kind of bizarrely speculative. And that's a lot what any, what NK Jemison is like, where you're reading it and you're like, "This is unsettling. I am uncomfortable. I'm not sure I know what just happened. I feel like this is really deep and really sad." <laughs> like I feel like a lot of HBO is like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see somebody do a good job with it and adapt it. It would be awesome. We are running out of time, so I don't know how much more 
<laughs> like how I, I feel like maybe briefly we can kind of touch on. I feel like we've made fantasy sound like a really like tough thing and a really (laughs) harrowing thing. And are you like, oh, well, you have to be ready for it. (laughs) Like there is a lot of really fun fantasy, like fun fantasy, adventurous fantasy. There really is. Yeah. Which maybe like a good place to go is portal fantasy, for instance. I mean, Chronicles of Narnia would be an example of portal fantasy where there's sort of like a portal to another world from our world. I really enjoy a good portal fantasy, <laughs> Labyrinth Lost by Zoraida Cordova. It's a YA book about a group of sisters who live in Brooklyn, but there's portal a portal into another kind of magical world. And the the family are it's they're from a family of witches and it's fun. I I like portal fantasy. I don't really love portal fantasy, but I mean Neil Gaiman wrote Neverwhere in order to like basically say adults should have their own version of Alice in Wonderland slash Wizard of Oz slash like whatever like kids portal fantasies are commonly known. So he wrote Neverwhere to be like the adult answer to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't really read much portal fantasy. I find the little bit I've read I haven't connected with. There's That's Daughter of Smoke and Bone, which is, I guess, a portal fantasy. And I do love that. I did until the third book. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And then I did after that, like seventy <laughs> percent. I finished it, but I did not love the third book either. That's interesting. Yeah. I loved the second book; it was so good. That was like a perfect yeah. book. I don't remember what I rated the second book, but I remember I was enjoying the series. Mm-hmm. And then I got to that one; I was like, I don't. I just she did the thing that she does both in the final book in that series, and she does it in the second book in the Strange, Strange the Dreamer duology, where she suddenly introduces a new character with a new problem and a new thread that also needs to be now wrapped up in the same book. And I'm like, why did you introduce a new thing in the final book when we have other problems that still need to be solved from the previous two books? We don't have time for this. Yeah. <laughs> no, but they are, it's definitely a, a, a well loved series. We've touched a little bit on like historical fantasy, alternate history fantasy, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell as you said, was a good example. I don't know if you guys have anything else in that category. Dread Nation is alternate history, the Civil War. Yep. Uh, I would say the Master of Jinn universe of P. Jelly Clark is like steampunky, but also mm-hmm. alternate history uh, Egypt. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't love the full length novel, the first one. I didn't love it. I didn't dislike it though, but I didn't love it. Mm-hmm. But the novellas were really great. And I'm I'm still, I'm jazzed to see where he goes with it. But it's a really fun yeah, one. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I feel like it's like, it's like, I want to say like early 1900s Cairo, but with yeah. magic. Very fun. Oh, it's like the Bear in the Nightingale, his historical fan or alternate history kind of real folklore elements are popping up. Yeah, for sure. I haven't read them, but I know Naomi Novik has a series. I think it starts Oh, Temeraire? Yeah, the Temeraire series, which is like the oh, Napoleonic yeah, Napoleon. Wars with dragons. Yeah. Why did everyone, why is everyone putting magic in the Napoleonic era? Because that's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is also Napoleonic. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I wish people would do some other eras because I like the idea of exploring other times in history yeah. with fantasy. Yeah, the, um, the Conductors by Nicole Glover. Oh, yeah. The Kingdom of Back, which is about Mozart's yes, sister. Yes. That's yes, that a was a cool magical one. version of Mozart. I liked that too. And that's yeah. kind of like Portal, isn't it? It's like another yeah. like, a little world they go into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there can be some really cool historical fantasy. I would be interested to see more of it. Oh, actually, another recent one that is really good that's like this is The Chosen and the Beautiful by Nevo. <gasps> it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's set in magical 1920s New York, retelling the Great Gatsby, but from the perspective of Jordan Baker, with her being a Vietnamese immigrant. So it's really interesting and like has this dreamy quality to it. So that I think is a really good option. So great. If anybody, I always tell people, if you liked, even if you haven't read the Great Gatsby, you liked the Baz Luhrmann movie read this book because it's just like all the vibes are there yeah, it's like it. sweet funny. sweet perfection <laughs> it's really good it is it's very good yeah so I do think you can also get there are probably other subgenres I'm forgetting there are other genre blends like fantasy horror which I mm. enjoy when it's like 
which genre is it? It's horror, but with magic. <laughs> I think that can be fun. We're um, seeing a new, like a whole cropping of dark academia in yeah, fantasy. Yeah, I love it. I just read um, A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. I think it came out today. And that one is YA, upper YA, like queer dark academia set at an all girls boarding school with like murder and witchy stuff. It got dark, like dark for a mm-hmm. YA book. It went, it was. It sounds somewhat similar in tone, uh, perhaps not as dark because it's YA to Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Uh, yeah, I actually think it's more similar. And she says in that she took inspiration from The Secret History by Donna Tart. It's more in that vein. <laughs> I mean, Secret History is not fantasy, but I do love Secret History. No. No. But this this one is more like secret history, but with like lesbians and witchy stuff. <laughs> so yes, yeah. yeah. Like and it, like I haven't read that much of it either. But like we were villains. I was like, I don't care about you guys. <laughs> I didn't like if we were villains just because I was like, oh, this is like store brand the secret history. I would rather read the secret history. <laughs> <laughs> no, I read this. I read if we were villains first, and so I loved it. I don't know. I mean, maybe I would feel similarly if I read Secret History first, but yeah. we haven't talked at all about like folklore and mythology books because mm-hmm. that's that's fantasy. Yeah. Well, I like you mentioned the Bear and the Nightingale. I like to make go even younger. I like the Rick Riordan Presents line, which is middle grade, but telling stories that are often portal fantasy, actually retelling mythologies from different cultures around the world. Mm hmm. Or even just his Percy Jackson books. Or, yeah, or the Percy Jackson books. I think I just, like, the Rick Riordan Presents ones are cool because it's, like, authors of color and authors from different mm-hmm. parts of the world. Um, and those are those are really fun. I like, uh, for an indie author, mm-hmm. Antoine Bondelet. I've read basically everything he's written. Mostly adult, but he just recently had a young adult one released this summer that I really like. And it's, like, young, young adult slash upper middle grade, huh. which is usually not my jam. I really liked it, but he pulls from like Orisha magic oh, cool. and mythology and West African mythologies. And it's always really fun. Like the different gods and goddesses we see. Yeah. And everything. Very cool. What's um, the title of that one? The Gatekeeper's Staff. It's TJ Young and the Orishas. Cool. Like series. That sounds great. Yeah, I like it a lot. I love mythology elements in books. I just mm-hmm. so Can you have a conversation them. about mythology books and not mention Madeline Miller? No. <laughs> I think that's against the rules. I, I DNF'd Song of Achilles. Get out of here, Jatan. Why are we friends? <laughs> I just oh couldn't God. take the, the pining and the, like, okay, I know. And, like, knowing what, obviously, because you know the mythology, I'm like, I don't, I don't, why am I invested in this? I'm not. I know what's going to happen. I just couldn't get into it. I know I'm terrible. If you want some, like, bizarre, grimdark, very grimdark, Arthurian retelling the for- by force alone by Lavi Tadar. I enjoyed, but it is not for every palette. Shoshana, don't read it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I straight up won't. I really like too, which I know people feel mixed about. It's like romance and it's like young adult, but uh, the rat is gone. Oh. oh, I liked the first book a lot. Which is the retelling, reimagining of uh, Thousand and One Nights, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, by Renee uh, Audia. Yeah. I really like the first the, the second one was fine but like I really loved I, I was a fan of the first one they those are those are fun another one for mythology that I think is great is Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno Garcia who is an author I generally love and this one is interesting because it's set in 1920s Mexico mm-hmm. but using elements of Mayan mythology. It's very cool. I liked it a lot. I, just, I know Bethany hated it, but Deathless by Catherine Valente does a good job of blending like Russian history with Russian folkloric elements. An actual blending of it where like they're affecting Stalinist times in a way that where you kind of don't know where history ends and folklore begins. So if you're interested in that period and in that kind of folklore, she does yeah. a pretty That's solid job with that. It was not my cup of tea. But it wasn't because of the folklore. <laughs> no. Check Histori- out content warnings if you need them on that one. <laughs> a uh, really great historical, but it's also kind of like horror-ish element, histor- alternate history, rather. Mm-hmm. Ring Shout. Yeah. Jelly Clark. Yeah, it's like a horror Novella. history 
fantasy yeah. kind of blend. Yeah. That's, that was great. such well, a Well, I mean, novel. also for alternate history, I don't know why I didn't think of this, but uh, The Water Dancer by ta Coates. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got like a hint. It's like magical realism, I guess, because it's just got like a hint of magic, but a lot of it is like. Mm. I mean, it's it's a strong hint, though. It's like very like integral to the plot. (laughs) That's true, but like the but the magic is like magic is a metaphor, you know. It's not like anyway, but yeah, yeah. She who became the sun. I just read new release. Shelley Parker Chan. And it's a retelling of the beginning of the Ming Dynasty in like 1300s China. Oh, interesting. It's very minimal fantasy. So I would definitely like someone who really likes historical stuff, Mm -hmm. wanting to get into fantasy and who likes like a slower paced, very character driven thing. I would recommend that. Awesome. So I think basically the point is whoever you are, whatever your reading tastes, there's a magic version of it (laughs) yeah there is something for you in the world of fantasy and hopefully this helps you find your thing i feel like fantasy (laughs) is just like taking absolutely any kind of book there is and being salt bay and just like sprinkling some (laughs) magic dust on it and making it fantasy yeah yeah pretty much i love it there's so much to read and it's a lot of fun Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we are going to move into the on my radar section, which I teased earlier. I know you're all so excited for it, (laughs) where I will share recent or upcoming book releases in science fiction, fantasy, and romance that I'm excited about. And then our guests will have the opportunity to share one as well. The books for today's episode will be released between August 17th and August 30th, 2021, with the exception of guest recommendations, which might be any recent or upcoming release. So I've got a few to share today, and I've read some of them. And they're fun. On August 17th, we're getting three books. First up is The Dating Playbook by Farah Rashone. This one is a sports romance, which is not usually my cup of tea, but I think there's a lot to like here and like in the series. The heroine is a fitness trainer and the hero was in the NFL, had to leave because of an injury and wants to get back in the game and wants to hire the heroine to like train him, basically. The one thing that I really loved about this is it deals with adults recognizing undiagnosed learning disabilities and like ADHD and stuff. And so the heroine is dealing with that. And I just like the fact that it's tackling stuff that we don't always talk about a lot. So that's cool. Also coming out on August 17th is Battle Royal by Lucy Parker. This one is a romantic comedy inspired by the Great British Bake Off, where two chefs who've been rivals since meeting on a baking show are competing to bake a cake for a royal wedding. That's so cute. (laughs) Yeah, it looks it looks cute. Then the one you've all been waiting for, Requiem of Silence by El Penelope, is the fourth and final book in this series I was talking about earlier that started with the Song of Blood and Stone. I'm really excited to see where it wraps up and how she ties up all the loose ends with the um, world building and plot elements that are, are going. And then the last one I want to talk about is coming out on August 24th. This is Devil in the Device by Laura Beth Johnson. It's the second book in a Y sci-fi duology that I loved the first one last year. It was so interesting, had so many twists and turns. And like revelations. I was like, what? And then ends on this big cliffhanger. So I need to know what's going to happen next. The plot of the first one basically follows this teen girl who is put into cryogenic suspension where she's supposed to be asleep for like a hundred years to travel with her family to a colony from earth. But when she wakes up, it's a thousand years later and everyone she knows is gone And there's lots of things happening in this world. She has to figure out what's going on. So it's great. I'm excited for it. Sounds tense. Yeah. (laughs) So do you guys have books you want to recommend? I have one that I know of. I am the worst with keeping up with new releases and when they're coming out and all of that. But one that I do know of is Nolan by Michael J. Sullivan. It's the first book in a new series in the same world as his other series, as both the Ryuria, those two series, Legends of the First Empire. Nolan is happening in between those. Yeah, I'm very excited for that. Awesome. I've got uh, Heavy Lies of the Crown by Ben Galley. This is the second book in the Skelusin Chronicles, and the Skelusin Chronicles 
are part of this like she, he wrote another series that takes place in the same world so this is a another series taking place in an existing world um and so the second book heavy lies the crown came out today august 3rd right now he's got like all of the other books in the series like the world i think they're all free right now on kindle to read to like celebrate the release of heavy lies the crown so get on it oh thanks guys so this has been chapter three podcast i'm your host bethany and you can follow us on twitter instagram and tiktok also youtube if you want to see our faces on camera like fingers crossed everything goes well with this uh you can also find me on youtube at beautifully books bethany talking about more books and jashana and lana's channels will be linked in the show notes along with all the books that we've mentioned in the episode as per usual. The next episode will be available in two weeks and this episode's bonus content will be available to patrons in the next few days. Thanks for listening.